Okay, welcome to our Sunday evening service. Let me remind you of a couple of things from the bulletin. Uh, parable uh, number 95 coming up on Wednesday night. Ladies Fellowship October 13th is coming Tuesday. And tonight at the end of the message, you'll have an opportunity to help us with the offering for the new printer copier that we had to purchase recently. And uh, hope you can join with us in that. I want to answer the question, can we be holy? Turn to the book of Galatians chapter 1 and hold that spot for just a moment. Can we be holy? Years ago, <clears throat> in another church, I was sitting in my office, and a lady walked in, and she was deeply concerned. And so I saw the concern etched on her face, and I said, what's the problem? And uh, she said, well, I have a big problem. And then I asked her the same question I asked all of my counselees. I said, uh, before we begin, will you share your salvation testimony with me? And the reason I do that is that if a person is unsaved, then the real counselor, the indwelling Holy Spirit, can't be called upon to help in the counseling session. No matter how many doctoral degrees I hold, I can't help a person who doesn't submit to the Holy Spirit. So that means that our real counselor is the Spirit of God. So she gave me a wonderful, and I think a very specific testimony about her faith in Christ. And when she came down at the end of her testimony, she said this. She said, Pastor... I know that I'm saved, and I know that I'm going to heaven. I have no question about that. So I said, well, let me ask you another question. Will you, to the best of your ability, tell me what you think your problem is and how you think I can help you resolve it? She said, well, that's easy. I just can't do it. And I said, do what? And she said, be holy like God. And uh, I immediately understood her frustration because I remember early in my Christian life, a lady came up to me in our church where I was saved, and she told me, quoted uh, um, Leviticus eleven forty four to me, and she said, just remember now, you be holy as God is holy. So that planted that seed in my mind, and I said, gee, how's that going to work? You know? <laughs> well, this dear lady uh, followed everything that we went on in the counseling session like that, and uh, <clears throat> I told her, I said, I can help you. And when she left the counseling session that afternoon, she actually told me that she had a new and renewed spiritual vigor and purpose for her life. Now, let me go to the Galatians passage and let me read to you verses 15 and 16 in the first chapter. It says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now you say, well, what does Paul's call to preach have to do with me? Very simply, one thing he says here applies to all of us. Here it is in verse 16. To reveal his son in me. To reveal his son in me. And that's what pleases God. He said it pleased God who separated me to reveal his son in me. So that answers a question that a lot of Christians have asked me over the years. I've had people say this, you know, I don't understand why when we get saved, we trust Christ as our Savior, but all the problems down here and all the difficulties we got through, why don't God just take us right then and take us on to heaven and there we'll have a great time for eternity? <laughs> and I said, well, I wondered that too when I got saved. And... Uh, but you know, one thing I learned is that one way to waste a lot of time in your Christian life is to be overly concerned about what ifs and why nots. <laughs> so here's another verse, Philippians 2.13. Paul said this, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So based on the Galatians 1 passage, what is God's good pleasure? Well, according to Paul, it's to please God by revealing his Son in me. Here's another verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. It says, When you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as the truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So my uh, quoting these verses, I hope will make a little bit more sense as we move along in the message. So what was my counselee's concern? Well, it was the same troubling concern I had experienced when I got saved as a teenage boy. How in the world can I be holy like God is holy? 
So that lady who gave me Leviticus 11, 44, you should be holy for I am holy, uh, confused me more than she helped me. She didn't intend to. She intended to really help me. So the counselee had a similar experience that I did, and as a result, she had frustrated herself by just being troubled over this thing. I can't be as holy as God. Well, all through the Pentateuch, Moses repeats the challenge frequently. He says, be holy for I am holy, giving God's word to the people. Now, the challenge appears again in the New Testament, believe it or not. Peter in 1 Peter 1.16 is writing to the people. He said, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. So now we have this New Testament verse saying that we have to be holy. Well, I'd like to take us through the process that I took that dear lady through that counselee that day and helped her to walk out of that counseling session and enjoy the rest of her Christian life. Let me give you some points to think about. Number one, two types of holiness. Two types of holiness. A lot of times we think only of the holiness of God, but there are two types of holiness mentioned in the Bible. And when my counselee grasped this, as I, as I shared it with her, her face lit up. First of all, there's absolute holiness. We have no problem with that one. God said, I am holy. So he is God. I am not. My counselee was not God. You are not God. No matter what you and I do, we can't become God. So let's leave it there. That's God's holiness. We're not going to ever be God. The next type of holiness is the kind that you and I experience. I call it relative holiness. God's holiness is absolute. Ours is relative. God said, be holy. And he used himself as the standard. And he used himself as the standard because he wanted to give, give to us at least three things that we needed to, to know about. Number one, we needed to know that the standard is based on him and therefore it's absolute. It can't get any better and it can't get any less. His standard of holiness is absolute. The second thing he wanted us to know about his holiness is that his holiness is totally unattainable by human effort alone. We just can't do it. So I told my counsel I said, look, join the rest of us, will you? I said, we can't do it either. <laughs> and then the third thing he wanted to know was that a holy life was dependent upon God's working in us through his Holy Spirit, not upon all the things that we were able to do. So our holiness is relevant to God's holiness depending on both our level of surrender and commitment. So there are two things that a Christian must be engaged in if he's going to be moving in the way he lives his life toward the absolute holiness of God. The first is he has to surrender, and that's giving up ourselves. Most of us don't want to do that. We give up ourselves. We give up our rights. We give up our personal ambitions. We give up our desire in favor of his will. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And then the commitment. This is the continuing to be submissive to that original act of surrender. Putting his will first despite circumstances or inserted distractions. So God's holiness is the absolute standard. That's not going to change. Our holiness is based upon how much control we give the Lord in our lives. So that first thing that I want you to see there is the two types of holiness. And uh, that really helped my counselee. And it'll help you to realize that in this life, you will not become God, no matter how good you live. So let me give you a number two here. I call this two types of dispositions. Two types of dispositions. <clears throat> Romans 5, 19 tells us this. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And what he's talking about there is Adam and Jesus. Adam disobeyed. And when that occurred, everyone after Adam needed redemption, just as Adam did. 
There had to be the shedding of blood. There had to be the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus obeyed. Adam disobeyed. Jesus obeyed. He was the second Adam. He was the Father's plan to provide that needed redemption. And those who repent and trust Jesus Christ, he said, will be made righteous. So this pictures two dispositions toward the matter of sin. Oswald Chambers, in uh, one of his devotional segments, says it this way, and I'm quoting now, just as the disposition of sin entered into the human race by one man, so the Holy Spirit entered the human race by another man. He goes on to say, and redemption means that I can be delivered from the heredity of sin and through Jesus Christ I can receive an unsullied heredity that is the Holy Spirit, end of quotation. That's from October the 6th in his, my utmost for his high. So when God says be holy, he knows that you and I need something we don't have, and that is an implanted disposition. The disposition toward righteousness. The disposition toward holiness. The same disposition that Jesus had toward doing the Father's will. I think this is what Paul meant when he said to the Galatian church, it pleased God to reveal his Son in me. So Paul had to be surrendered. It wasn't just salvation in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus, but it was what followed when he surrendered day by day. He indicated on numerous occasions this was a daily thing, even a moment-by-moment -moment thing. And the word reveal, it pleased God to reveal his son in me. This is interesting. The Greek word here is from the same Greek root as the word revelation. That's the title of John's book in the New Testament. And the word is apocalypto. It means to take the cover off something, to disclose what is there, to reveal or to make known. So what Paul is telling the church at Galatia here is everything that I encounter, God wants me to respond in a way that reveals his grace and reveals his mercy and reveals his power. So the ungodly world may never read the Bible, but I can guarantee you one thing, they will read you, and they will read me. And when they don't like what they see, they will be pretty quick to tell us so. So Paul must have gotten the message because he wrote back to the church at Philippi from his position on Rome's death row. And he said, with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body whether it be by life or by death. Paul said at that particular point in his time on death row, he didn't know whether he would be executed. He suspected he would, but he also had on one occasion been released for a year and allowed to go about ministry. So he wasn't quite sure, but he said it doesn't matter. He said no matter what happens to me, if I live or if Caesar takes my life, the only thing that really matters is whether I live or die Will Christ be revealed in me? I've often said that Christians have two primary responsibilities to the unsaved world. One is to let the unsaved world see how a dedicated, born-again believer in Jesus Christ actually lives. The other is to see how that same person actually dies. Christ's disposition must be placed in us so that it can control both our perspective and our practice. And by the way, we have no problem practicing what God wants us to if we've allowed his perspective to dominate our lives. The more we outwardly manifest, reveal, make known the disposition of Jesus Christ, the more relative holiness will be displayed to the world. Now, reminding us, God's holiness is not our holiness. God's holiness is his character. God's holiness is absolute perfection. So when he tells us, be holy, for I am holy, what he's saying is, adopt my disposition, adopt my perspective, and start living your life the way I see that it ought to be lived. 
The more we outwardly manifest, reveal, make known Christ's disposition, the more relative holiness we display to the world. You know what Jesus called us? He called us light in a world dominated by darkness. And he said, let your light so shine that may see men may see your good works. Your good works are manifested holiness, you know, that they will turn to the Lord. And then he called us salt in a rotting world. He said, you're a preservative. Adam's contribution to each of us is the disposition towards sin. And Christ's contribution to each of us who is born again is the disposition toward holiness. And you say, well, I don't know how to do that. Well, the only thing you can do is say this. Say, get up every morning and say, now, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to be a holy person today. I don't know how I'm going to manifest you today, but I know that if I just simply let you guide my life, you, you will speak through me to the hearts of those around me. Well, that leads to my next point. I call this one number three, two types of outcomes. Two types of outcomes. Each, each one of the dispositions we've talked about, the disposition towards sin produces certain characteristics. If you've been paying attention to the news, you know what some of the characteristics are, right? But the disposition toward holiness produces a different type of outcome. Those disposed to sin are going to go around committing sin. Those disposed to holiness will seek to act like Christ in a world dominated by sin. So surrender to the Holy Spirit will provide enabling. And what the enabling does is it reinforces the ability to express the holiness of Jesus Christ. A lot of folks have the idea that you can work up holiness in kind of like a, you know, like a holy fever. You know, if I just do this, I'll be holy. If I just work this up, I'll be holy. If I just get emotional, I'll be holy. Holiness is not an emotion. It's a disposition. You and I do not have to do exactly like God in every situation, but we do have to be obedient in every situation, and that's how we reflect his holiness. You and I are going to be held accountable one day for surrender and commitment. A lot of folks are on their way to heaven. They've repented of sin. They've trusted Christ as Savior. But they're living their lives as if they didn't. And they don't think they're going to be held accountable. Because after all, Jesus shed his blood. All my sins are covered. No matter what I do, it doesn't matter. A lot of folks have that idea. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior... More in your life matters than it ever did before. <laughs> and people are watching you, and God is watching you and me both. In the Old Testament, the favorite thing that the prophet said, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro in all the earth, beholding the good and the evil. So let me give you a, I call it a perceptive quotation from Oswald Chambers. This is for October the 6th in his devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest. Very convicting. So are you ready for this? Here it goes. If Jesus Christ is to regenerate me, what is the problem that he is up against? I have a heredity I had no say in. I am not holy, nor am I likely to be. And if all Jesus Christ can do is to tell me that I must be holy, that his teaching plants in me despair. But if Jesus Christ is a regenerator, one who can put into me his own hereditary holiness, then I begin to see what he is driving at when he says, be holy, for I am holy. End of quotation. Well, I hope you see it. We're, we're redeemed. We, we are the, the, the benefactors of an act on the part of Jesus Christ that required him to suffer as you and I suffer, to bear the condemnation that God placed upon sin, which we would have had to, board, to bear ourselves. But we've been redeemed by his precious blood. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed at his child, I am. We have been infused with his personal 
disposition to holiness. I remember the night I got saved 65 years ago. My whole attitude toward everything around me changed. I began recognizing things happening that I never before that moment considered sin. But I became alert to that when I trusted Christ as my Savior. I had a disposition toward holiness. Granted, it was brand new and it hadn't been developed yet. But I sure recognized what had happened in my life. God wanted to enable me, as he wants to enable you, to manifest that new relationship we have with him and Jesus Christ to the world around us. So all we have to do is allow the implanted disposition to surface at our present level of holiness. One thing we don't want to do is we don't want to compare ourselves to somebody else. Uh, we don't, we're not in a race to see who's going to cross the finish line of holiness first. What we should do is compare ourselves to Jesus Christ. That's the absolute standard because we've always got somewhere to move to when we look at that. God's holiness is absolute and Jesus living in us is disposed to that absolute holiness. So as I submit to Jesus Christ, he works in me to manifest the Father's holiness. Well, that counselee that sat in my office years ago down in Kentucky, she went out to live a glorious and enjoyable Christian life. I stayed in contact with her for a while, even after we moved up here, and God had used her. She had uh, uh, become a Sunday school teacher. She had uh, gotten involved in one of the mission projects of the church, and she was living for the Lord. And she said that she no longer feared the concept of holiness because she said, no, all I know is that God just wants me to do what he wants me to do and leave it all up to him. She said that she learned this. My relative holiness was imperfect, but it was always moving toward God's absolute holiness. End of quotation. So I told her, I said, well, you got the point of the counseling session. <laughs> I said, that's what we were trying to, to communicate with. You know, there are a lot of people out there like that who think that because they don't, you know, keep five or six set standards or something like that that somebody has uh, imposed upon them, that therefore they're not holy. God is the one that's evaluating our holiness, and he's looking at surrender and commitment. Those are the two things he's watching. And uh, I don't know what you have to go through to surrender. I know what I have to go through to surrender. And I know when I've made a commitment what my obligations are, and I know how I'm standing in relationship to that. But it's up to you to know what you're doing. And God loves us, and he cares for us. Isn't it amazing how God wants to shower us with mercy and grace? And all we have to do is just simply love him back and obey him. Well, thank the Lord that he overlooks our imperfections. Aren't you glad yeah. of that? And when he overlooks our imperfections, he sees us through the lens of Jesus Christ. So as far as God is concerned, when I stand before him in the final judgment, he's going to see that I am in Christ and Christ has borne all my imperfections, all my faults, all my sins, as he has yours. Well, let's stand together for prayer. <clears throat> Father, we love you. We thank you for your guidance in our lives. We thank you for all that you're doing day by day to help us. And we pray that right now in this moment, you'll speak to our hearts during the invitation as we open the altar. Someone may need to come to trust Christ as Savior. Someone need to, may need to come to pray or for some other reason. So speak to our hearts now and help us to be receptive and responsive to your moving of your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.